Welcome to Bread and Roses, everyone. I'm Mariam Namazi. Hi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the terrorist attack against London that took place recently. We'll also have an insane fatwa about how no one listens to insane fatwas anymore. Partly because they've been ridiculed, rightly so. Always and forever. And our slice of life is from Iran and about women motorcycling. The interview this week is part of Mariam's speech in uh, Women in Secularism Conference in Washington, D.C., which was organized by Center for Inquiry. Stay with us, don't go away. We hope you enjoy this week's program. A few days ago, there was the a terror attack in London, at Westminster, near Westminster, near the UK Parliament. We know that four people have been killed, uh, many have been injured. And of course, our heart goes out to those who aren't going to come home. They're just not going to come home after a day out ever again. And of course, what we do need to remember that it's not just an issue here in Europe. This is an international problem. Over 50 times more people are killed people are in suffering. the Middle East and North Africa. They're suffering, exactly. People are suffering yeah. daily base, on daily basis from the right-wing Islamist groups in many, many different countries. So the, the pouring, of, you're pouring out of grief and unhappiness about and objection and condemnation, it needs to be global. I think that, that's the first thing. And we all have every person or family who has suffered from the Islamists, they actually feel the pain of the families of those who lost their lives in the, in the bombings in London. And we, we have to sort of yeah. say that this is a global issue and that brings global solidarity as well. But also when you look at the people who've been killed, I mean, they're from all over the place, aren't they? And that's exactly one of the ways that it shows that this is not about migrants. There are migrants who are also getting killed. This is not an immigration issue. It's about targeting a far-right Islamist movement. I was reading that the MI5 uh, says that there are 3,000 extremists, Islamist extremists in the UK. So clearly there's a need to target those. And it's interesting how immediately after this, they knew exactly where to go as well in Birmingham. So they know of these extremists. And that's why the profiling of just generally Muslims or various nationalities is irrelevant and it wastes time and resources. It's targeting these known networks that are key. Yes, and Khalid Masood was born um, in UK. Uh, he's homegrown, um, you know, part of a network of the um, Islamic terrorists, which there are 3,000 of them at least on the MI5 list, and a broader range of that. We, we meet with them in universities and different places who, you know, the jihadist, the violent and non-violent version of them, we meet them in various uh, walks of life. And they're organized, they are known groups and they need to be targeted and people need to, everybody, all communities, everybody need to isolate these groups and they don't belong to civilized society and they need to be actually challenged in, at the society level and actually if they take, uh, commit criminal activity, they need to be punished severely as well. Yeah, and it's interesting because Khalid Masood has this uh, background of violence, didn't he? And it's interesting because when you look at the Islamist movement or far-right movements, they are a bunch of hooligans and thugs. They're like the mafia. They thrive on violence. And so for there to be some sort of, you know, uh, trying to grasp at what are their the political reasons behind why they've committed such a crime. I mean, you were talking earlier about the fact that, well, lots of people face abuse, violence, and so on and so yeah. forth. They don't go out and kill people. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you face racism, I mean, the Telegraph was saying that the first thing that triggered uh, uh, Khaled Masood was uh, um, racism that he faced in a village in Kent. Well, you know, normal, um, I come from a tradition that normal activities that you face, just know you join anti-racist movement. Yeah. If you face unemployment and poverty, you don't go and join UKIP and the right wing. You join the trade unions and organization who fight for better life and try to organize the working class. That's what you do. So that's the alternative, the progressive, humane alternative. The alternative is not to go and join the extremist and all right wing fascists. You know, that's the, the, there is a choice that society is making and that's what we need to promote. If people have grievances of various kind, 
you know, don't justify terrorism. Organize, you organize, organize. You don't organize. go and kill people yeah. because you, you are unhappy about, you yeah. know, somebody's made a racist comment. Yeah, exactly. We, we've all faced racism, you know. Uh, we've faced, many of us have faced police brutality. Many of us have faced inequality. You know, you don't challenge it by doing exactly what you faced. You, you, you take a humane alternative to it. And that's, a, you know, there's a clear right-wing narrative as well people who actually want to create division. Islamists always thrive on a situation that there is chaos yeah. and that that's what they want to do. And these are the terrorist, terrorist acts actually they, they commit is clearly targeted and politically motivated to clear chaos in society. You could see exactly this is what the right wing um, the fascists do as well. You know, look at the narrative of Tommy Robinson. Immediately he's there, he's changed, you know, there the, is a global war going on between people and immigrants and foreigners. Exactly and what the Islamists say as well. Exactly, yeah. and that's what, you know, they, they, yeah. they are, they've signed up to the clash of civilization, the narrative that Katie Hopkins gives on uh, um, Fox, News. Fox News or Nigel Farage. These are the right-wing narratives that have, bears no relation to experience of people who live in London or in UK. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing we need to yeah. challenge as well. People were united brilliantly in Britain against uh, um, the narrative of chaos and what the Islamists want to achieve. And that's what we need to do. Definitely, yeah. In the Center for Inquiries, Women and Secularism conference, I spoke about women's resistance against Islamism and particularly the first part of my talk was about the movement against veiling and to unveil. I thought that was a good speech. I, you know, if I... If, I, if, if you I, have to say so, yeah. yeah I think it's a good speech. <laughs> but anyway, we wanted to show you a clip of that uh, speech and, uh, you know, talk about this issue because the issue of the veil is quite an important one and one that often is said, you know, it's not that important whereas it's actually quite central to the Islamist project to control women. Yeah. And I think it's a daily issue. You constantly have the leaders of the Islamic regime in Iran and in Middle East and North Africa constantly harassing women, constantly attacking women, constantly discussing hijab. I mean, that's, um, yeah. you know, that's, it, it's a daily issue. You can't just ignore it. You can't just say this is not an issue. And it's interesting because Ali Khamenei, the supreme spiritual leader of Iran, he recently talked about how feminism is a Zionist plot, you know, to destroy the society. Yeah. And it, in a sense, it's true, isn't it? Because if you have equal rights for women, it destroys an Islamic society, a theocratic the, society. Always wrap it around a foreign intervention. Yes. Always. Zionist plot. Actually, if within the Iranian society, majority, 99% of the Iranian population despise the whole compulsory veiling in the society. That's why they haven't been able to succeed in imposing compulsory veiling. Five minutes, even five minutes, the rule of the Islamic regime is removed from the Iranian society. We'll see what the, the, uh, the women of Iran have, have made of. Yeah, so watch this uh, uh, section of uh, my speech on the veil and women's resistance against Islamism now. I hope you enjoy it. When I was 12 years old, obviously I liked ABBA and Snoopy very much. Um, the, the Hezbollah came to my school and it's, it's a generic word we use for those who do God's dirty work, you know, they belong to the party of God. And they came in order to segregate the boys from the girls in the playground, so they were standing there to make sure we don't mix, because it was a mixed school, and the schools hadn't been Islamicized yet. And of course, what we did was just run circles around them. We'd run into the boys' section, and the boys would run into ours. But it's just one example of just the obsession of Islamists with controlling the female body and preventing mixing that is deemed to be religiously impermissible. It's funny how they always tell us when we speak about the veil or gender mixing how there are so many more important things in the world, but they spend an awful lot of time trying to control veiling and gender mixing. It's ironic. So even at 12, they viewed girls as 
sources of fitna or chaos in society. And this applies even to younger children. Uh, this is a great example. This is of a uh, musical ensemble in Iran. It's called the Parisian Ensemble. And they had to go through several photographs before the censors accepted them. This was the first photo uh, of the ensemble which was rejected because the girls are not veiled, though they don't need to be veiled until the age of nine or until they reach puberty. Um, so this is the second photo where, of course, the girls have now been veiled, but it still wasn't acceptable to the censors. They thought the girls' arms were visible and it needed to change. And this is the final photo where the girls have put, been put in the back and their arms and hairs have been covered. So. It applies to younger children and it rots and seeps into everything. Uh, just to give you an example, in 2013, the Iranian regime passed a law in its majlis or Islamic assembly which said that fathers could marry their adopted daughters. And the reason behind this was because they said when the girl reaches uh, her puberty, because she's not really their daughter, there, there could be sexual tension between the, the stepfather and the adopted daughter, and therefore it's best that the father marry her, and then she doesn't need to wear a veil, and there doesn't need to be gender segregation. So just rots and seeps into everything. The, the veil and the segregation that follows it is, is really central to the Islamist project. And their aim is to completely erase women from the public space, and girls. And of course, as Islamists, I mean people who are part of a political far-right movement trying to impose theocracies, Sharia law, similar in fundamentals to the Christian right, the Buddhist right, the Hindu right, and the Jewish right. There's an artist, his name is Philip uh, Toledano, and he's done a series on Iranian censorship of women, calling it Portraits of Absence. And it shows how regular items that are on sale in the shops are uh, where women are on their covers. There are black markers used to completely erase them from the packaging. And you see this on magazines and adverts. Uh, here's another one where the woman's been completely blacked out. And when you look at these photos, I think what it, it tells you is that the chador or the borqa and the niqab are really the fabric version of this black marker, erased, devoid of humanity, disappeared. Uh, I often compare women to the disappeared of Argentina or the disappeared of the uh, 1980s in the Iranian regime where m countless political prisoners were massacred, buried in mass graves, and still no one knows where they are. But this disappeared is based on gender, not political opinion and belief. And despite all the rules that they've imposed, it's never still enough for them. Every day, the fatwa factories across the world issue more rules and more restrictions for women and girls. Uh, we have a TV po program called Bread and Roses. It's uh, beamed into Iran using illegal satellite dishes. And the Iranian regime has labeled us immoral and corrupt, so it's definitely something you should be watching. <laughs> um, and in this uh, program, we have a segment called Insane Fatwa, and we have found a correlation between, uh, you know, the, the most stupidest fatwa versus the imam with the longest and most stupidest name. And there's definitely some scientific research that needs to be done into this, but I'm, I'm going to stand by it despite the fact that there hasn't been evidence. So, you know, the, these rules, don't bring attention to yourself. Don't wear perfume. Don't walk in the middle of the road. Don't uh, wear jeans. Don't show your ankles or your hair. Don't cycle. Don't drive. Don't laugh out loud. Don't sing. Don't slap your thighs. We do a lot of sli uh, thigh slapping on bread and roses just to annoy them. <laughs> And don't go to football matches because really the only reason you're going there in the first place is to glare at the men's thighs, the footballers' thighs. And don't eat cucumbers and bananas. I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that up to your own imagination. <laughs> so, you, you know, it's a well-oiled propaganda machinery that warns you against any transgressions. Here's a couple of uh, billboards in Iran and, and other places, Afghanistan, for example. Now, this is a baby, for goodness sakes, and it says, our children are protected via hijab. And this one says, if 
uh, no one wants to eat the leftovers of flies. Uh, and if you don't want to be that, then you need to be properly veiled. So there's this constant barrage of messages saying you're loose if you're not veiled. And of course, you know, in Iran, they have morality police, as they do in Saudi Arabia and in other places. Um, ISIS has them. I read about ISIS uh, uh, morality police walking around with these sort of metal pinchers that tear at the flesh of women who, whose flesh is visible. Uh, so there's morality police, uh, like in Iran, for example. Uh, just recently, they hired another 7,000 morality police in Tehran alone because they can't control women. And no matter how much they try, exactly. You're not keeping us down. Uh, so, you know, this is a picture of it. I mean, it's constant harassment. People are stopped. They're told their veil, their hair is showing. There, there are fines involved. There can be up to two months in prison. And, of course, there are vigilantes that throw acid in the faces of women who are not properly veiled and on and on and on. Now, this is a wonderful cartoon from Persepolis. I don't know if you've seen the book and the film uh, of Marjan Satrapi, and sh here she's, you know, you've got some of the police saying, yes, but when you run, your behind makes movements that are, how do you say, obscene. And she says, well, then don't look at my ass. <laughs> and she says, I yelled so loudly that they didn't even rest me, you know, scared them off. It reminds me of the story I heard. Uh, I don't know if it was one of our friends or what, but uh, this woman was saying the morality police had stopped them, saying that their, her daughter's um, uh, legs were showing, and her daughter was like six years old. So she took her umbrella and started beating the guy and saying, stop looking over my daughter's legs. <laughs> and I guess that's a good offense. The best defense is offense, isn't it? So, um, so it isn't a lot of fuss over a piece of clothing, as we're often told. The veil and segregation that it enforces are merely the most public manifestations of what's considered women's place in society, policed at every turn. There's a wonderful Afghan-American writer, Nushin Arbabzadeh, who I've just become familiar with. Uh, she's done a wonderful piece on this where she says that the discussions around the veil here in the West are so sanitized, whereas the really sinister campaigns, the oppressive nature, are very often completely ignored. Here's a perfect example of it. It says, have you ever seen a, an onion uh, that has a worm in it? No because an onion has seven layers of the chador, but the, but the uh, potato has a very light clothing and is always in danger of being eaten by worms. And then at the end it says, so sisters, be an onion. Be an onion. Wow, fun, profound. And in Iran, as in many places, veiling is imposed on the backs of slogans like death to the unveiled women. And in Iran, one of the, their main slogans it was Yoru Sari Yotu Sari, which means you either wear the veil or you will be beaten. And this is a cartoon where, you know, there are Islamists in Iran saying women who aren't properly veiled should be raped. Now, don't forget the veil is compulsory in Iran. And they're still saying this. And this is a perfect example of others fighting for girls to be brought home against Boko Haram in Nigeria. And, you know, the Iranian government's officials are saying, rape the bad hijabi girls, teach them a lesson. And, of course, as you know, every calamity from earthquakes, you all remember boobquake, Jennifer McCright's boobquake, to rivers running dry are blamed on unveiled or improperly veiled women. And this is a wonderful cartoon from Mona. Um, Nayastani. He shows, you know, the officials stealing money, going to Canada, um, throwing, uh, someone throwing acid in a woman's face, police beating someone who's got a banner saying freedom, executions, floggings, but here's a woman's hair and the river runs dry. It, it's typical, um, the sort of uh, attitude they have towards women. And even if in places where it isn't compulsory, including in the West, there is this immense pressure you know, so there's this idea, if you're veiled, uh, you go to heaven, otherwise you go straight to hell. I'll see you all there. You know, the, the sort of, uh, you're immoral, you know, you're loose. In Turkey, I don't know if you heard recently about a woman um, who was um, beaten on the bus for wearing shorts. She's a nurse. 
And the guy was released, though Erdogan held so many free thinkers in, in prison, none of them seemed to be able to get released, but this guy got released and he said he just thought you know, she was wearing improper clothing. Um, in Britain, uh, young women who are hijabis but aren't dressed in the way that the Islamists and the fundamentalists think appropriate are called hojabis. So there's this constant, constant pressure. Children are veiled. Children, for goodness sakes, and no one bats an eyelid. Oh yes, I forget. Hijab is a right and a choice. Even if it's when it regards children. Specifically speaking though, Choice is a formality when there is little right or choice to remove one's veil or remain unveiled without being vilified. This is a perfect Jesus and Mo cartoon. Muhammad says, oh, stop complaining, Jesus. You should feel protected like a precious pearl within an oyster shell. And Jesus is like, I just feel hot. And Muhammad says, the important thing is to show the world that it's a liberating, empowering choice, a symbol of your freedom to express your identity. Then he says, can I take it off now? No. <laughs> and that's the thing, you can never take it off. But I think, most importantly, whose side are you on? Of course, there are women who choose and have a right not to have an abortion in Ireland. But you must side with the women who want one and cannot have one because of the states and the Catholic Church's control over women's bodies. But when it comes to us in the veil, it's the other way around. Many feminists, many liberals, those on the left, and I say that as someone firmly on the left, defend the right to be veiled, but never defend the right to be unveiled and to live to tell the tale. What a betrayal. We're told it's our culture, our religion. Leave us to it. Respect it. Well, I'm sorry. Many of us will not respect the violation of women's rights, no matter how it is packaged and dressed. Culture isn't homogeneous. <laughs> Culture isn't homogeneous. Neither are communities or societies. Defending the group right to impose veiling and segregation defends the powerful. This sort of identity politics ignores and it negates dissent. It fails to see the social and political struggles and class politics. The result of all this, says Keenan Malek, the British writer, is that solidarity has become increasingly defined not in political terms as collective actions in pursuit of certain political ideals, but in terms of ethnicity and culture. And that's exactly what the far right does as well. They homogenize culture, entire societies and communities and immediately say that they're incompatible with Western society so as to promote, if we're honest, what is fundamentally white politics, white identity politics. When it comes to culture, anyway, whose culture are we talking about? The woman and the man resisting the veil or the theocrats who are imposing it? There is an immense unveiling movement in Iran, for example, even though it is compulsory and punishable by fines and imprisonment. This is a wonderful photo taken in Iran in front of a poster which says, sisters, you must obey your Islamic hijab. And she's there without a veil. And even men are joining this movement with, with messages saying that it's unfair that women should have to be covered up and that people should be free to dress as they choose. When you are faced with a state and a movement, the Islamist movement, that aims to erase you, erase you from the public space, your refusal to disappear is an important form of resistance and dissent. Shirazi. A very long name means? Stupid fatwa. Thank you. <laughs> he has been speaking to a group of people, religious figures as well, and he was talking about how it is becoming so difficult to keep one's faith. You wake up in the morning, 
very faithful, but the evening you've lost everything. You're a car fan. You gotta keep mm. yourself away from the whole thing in the morning, afternoon. These opportunities, families, lots life, of opportunities to lose your faith. Mm, he he talks about you know including the internet. You know things that is, that, that is a big one. Big one, yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. You lose your faith big time on, yeah. on on the net. So you know this is all coming right before Iranian New Year, which was just recently, you know, he was saying that people have to be careful. They never learn from their mistakes. They go out, they do stuff that they shouldn't be doing, and then they're going to burn as a result. They're going to yeah. lose their faith. And the fireworks is not good. And it's it's just, haram, it's sinful, yeah. it shouldn't Somebody be. Somebody asked him, why don't you issue a fatwa? Do you know what he said? He said, nobody listens to fatwa anymore. <laughs> That's why there's no point issuing a fatwa anymore. Isn't that what we've been saying all along? Keep it to yourself. No one's interested. Stupid fat wise. Behna Shafi, she is a 27 year old woman motorcyclist in Iran who has been fighting the Ministry of Sports to allow women to race their bikes. And finally, after three years of hard struggle, she managed to persuade them to let them have the first ever female motorcycle race in yeah. Iran. And um, she has to fight every inch of the way against uh, you know, the view that women cannot uh, uh, ride bikes and um, against the government restrictions, fighting and petitioning and protesting and actually wearing boys clothes and sort of um, riding her bike. Yeah, um, I mean, she pretended she was a boy to be able to ride in the streets and she's been using her brother's bike since she was 15 and she says, you know when you tell a child not to touch something hot and they want to touch it more? And that's exactly what happened with her when she was told by mostly men, she says, that her place was in the kitchen, cooking, cleaning. You know, she fought back more and she felt she had to do it. Not only at home, on the streets as well. A lot of uh, women been harassed by the vigilantes and Islamists, but they're fighting all the time. The fact that, you know, it, it is natural for people to actually fight because that's a normal human activity, you know. Um, so, yeah, like yeah, and to think that, you know, riding a motorbike is considered banned because it, you look unchaste if you're sitting on it. And it reminds me of the time when I was living in Sudan a long, long time ago in the early 80s. And I rode a motorbike there as well. And I fell once and I saw all these men rushing towards me and I thought they're actually rushing to help me. And they started screaming at me and saying how unchaste it was and how haram it was for a woman to be riding a motorbike. So it reminded me when I saw her doing this, it reminded me of that time a very long time ago when I tried it too. So well done to her for slice of uh, life this week, yeah, and this brings us beautiful. to the end of this brings us to end of that program. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our program this week. Until next week, we'll see you again at the same time and same place. Until then, goodbye. goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our 
year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.